Welcome to Lazy Susan Theater Company's debut original production, If the Moon Never Came Back. The show runs for approximately 75 minutes with no intermission. Please be advised that following our show, there'll be a quick turnaround for the zoo story. Silence your cell phones, sit back, and enjoy the show. Drive. I used to think I had the most perfect address. I mean, 1313 Pecos Drive. And that is Pecos, not Picos. If you say Picos, you are wrong. <laughs> I used to get off the bus and walk up the driveway thinking I had the most perfect house in the neighborhood. The Goldilocks of childhood homes, really, this signature red brick with these big, white, very colonial pillars out front, and this gorgeous oak tree we all affectionately call Steve. Not for any particular reason, other than that some trees need names, and this giant pine that dropped needles everywhere that got struck by lightning one time. Perfect. 1313 Pecos Drive. It spoiled me, really. Now when I look at places to live, I always have to think about whether or not the address sounds right. The building I live in now is called 777, by the way. 1313 gave me an affinity for perfect numbers. Every sidewalk tile gets two steps. I only put numbers divisible by 11 in the microwave. I remember a number of years ago, someone hit our mailbox in the middle of the night. We woke up to a trail of red brick down the street. Someone found our house number about halfway around the block. Dear 1313 Pecos Drive, I woke up in my old bed this morning, same as I did every morning from the fourth grade when I moved out of the room my sister and I shared till the day I moved out of the house. I always loved the way I can see the moon through the slats and the blinds when I wake up in the middle of the night, and the way the sun stumbles in through them to wake me up in the morning. And how I can hear the birds chirp outside. I never use the blinds in my bedroom at home, and I always sleep with the window open so I can hear the birds on their morning commute. I took that with me, like most of my other things. I left my room with nothing to remember me by. It feels the same with my eyes closed, but 
I know my bed lives in four empty walls, robbed of their belongings, bare faux red brick I insisted on when we finally redid my room from its previously signature green and blue. You can still see it through the rushed white paint job in the far corner by the window. Rogue command hooks hold out their empty hands, abandoned by a hasty burglar in a hurry to make something new. And it doesn't feel the same. Nothing does. My little room has become an island of misfit toys. The place things go when no one in the house wants to look at them anymore. I have to push them aside to even get in the door. They renovated my old high school. I have mountain cedar, allergies now, going home gives my nose whiplash. I can't find the kitchen spices. Someone else's laundry is always in the machine. The dog died while I was gone. I don't know where these new bowls go. Since when do we have so many bowls? Less people live here now. When you've got more bowls, that seems a bit unnecessary. Overkill, really. My friends hang out without me. They say I live too far, which is true. I suppose Chicago is kind of far. The more I see them, the more my inclusion feels like some sort of weird obligation. They turn themselves into a fog, obscuring the people I used to know so well, the people I, who filled my entire room with balloons on my 14th birthday, the people who I co-founded a secret club with in the sixth grade about a tree on the playground we all called Roger, the people I made stupid iMovie movies with at sleepovers, the people who ate lunch with me in Mr. Barb's room in the eighth grade because cafeterias suck and he would let us, eat, uh, he would let us mess around on the stage after we finished eating, the people who knew which door in my house had a broken lock and invited themselves in during the summer, the people I'd squeeze into my bed at 3 a.m. on New Year's Eve, and getting six people into a full-size bed is hard. This is an incredible feat. And now, they leave in the ball drops. I remember all of us sitting on the floor in the hall during lunch in high school. And we would talk about college, and, and Gigi would cry thinking about how we were all going to leave, but I was already gone. In the end, I don't know if they left me or if I left them. I used to write letters to the next person to live in my house and hide them in the broken doorknob on my closet door. I think they're gone now. We fixed the doorknob a while ago. I forget what I wrote. I just think I wanted someone to know that I've been there. I walk around my house, my neighborhood. I, I used to walk around the block with my eyes closed just to make sure I knew what everything looked like in case I ever went blind. That is something I actually did. I, I walk and I get these flashes, these stop motion animations of my memories playing back in my head and I wonder when this home became a house. I think I decided a long time ago I didn't really need it anymore. I gave it an Irish goodbye and went on my way. Tearing down the street in the middle of the night with a trail of red brick in my wake. I've outgrown my hometown. None of it fits quite right anymore. Like a poorly cared for wool sweater that is both somehow too tight and too loose in all the wrong spots. And it's got those little hanger bumps on the shoulders because it didn't dry right before you put it away and now it's been in the closet for too long and you wriggle around them to try to make it look like you did when you first got it, but it's just too fucking itchy. And you only tried it on because you forgot about it. So when you saw it in the closet, you got all excited because it used to be your favorite sweater, but now it doesn't fit, so you just have to put it back from something you never tried it on in the first place because you couldn't possibly get rid of it because it used to be your favorite sweater and maybe one day it'll fit better again. Dear 1313 Pecos Drive, there are times when I'm distracted sitting on the floor in the middle of my room like I did when I had homework to do, properly neglecting my desk, in the little patch of sun from my window where the carpet gets all warm and the light hits the jar that used to contain my favorite candle just and it sends a blue-green reflection and the scent of peaches around the room and I forget. I forget my old sweater doesn't fit right. I forget I'm allergic to the air I'm breathing. I forget the ungodly quantity of bowls in the kitchen and I'm just here. And I have been here and I will be here just sitting on my floor in my patch of sun in my room with my stuff and my favorite candle and all I know is home. I'll see you next year. <laughs> Yours truly, Emma.
The moon is a witness. She sees just about everything under the sun, and that pun is very much intended, although I'm not sure if she's on top or on bottom or maybe on her side. I don't want to assume anything about the moon's rendezvous. Confession time. I cry, like all the time. As a kid, adults called me sensitive. As an adult, parents tell you, let it out, suck it up. Crying is a superpower, all sorts of things. I used to wonder why I cry so often, but truly it's not as tragic as it may seem. Lyrics that hit too close to home on the car stereo, the corner store being out of the one ingredient I need for my PMS-induced craving meal, <laughs> adding a touching note to my growing box of love letters, <laughs> a graying lady with lipstick and her best errands dress at the farmer's market, Paddington too. I mean, come on, Paddington too! Ah. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, my tears are one of the tides that the moon controls because she sees almost all of them fall. I can't count the times I've been right here, convinced I am utterly alone in the universe. A common experience for your 20s, I'm told. I try to drown everything out, try to give my brain a second to catch up with my heart, try to wrangle my most recent bout of tears, and if she's trying to comfort me, I can't hear her. Not as my world is ending and the Cubs fans are waddling down the street and drunken last resort hookups are trying their hardest to climb three-story stairs without saying the wrong name in between wobbly kisses. No. None of that can affect me. Not when I'm convinced the weight of the world could possibly crush me. But every time I try to calm myself down and rein in the tears at least a little bit before crawling into bed, I can feel her there. She peeks at me through the trees, her distant glow a spotlight on what is always currently the worst I have ever felt ever. <laughs> In front of her, I can be shamelessly, selfishly sad. I let tears marathon down my cheeks and snot drip to the earth, and air sees my lungs, and consider the very real, possible reality that fairy tale endings don't exist, and some princes turn back into frogs, and maybe the sunset ride into the carriage isn't going to happen this time. And when I do, the moon casts her illuminated arm around me, shielding me, protecting me, cradling me as if reminding me that there is something to return to. The moon sees all that every damn time. I hope she thinks I'm a pretty crier. <laughs> I like to think I'm a pretty crier. <laughs> After enough heartbreak, you get skilled at tears. <laughs> Do you think the moon can feel heartbreak? Maybe during that moment, night after night, when she catches the sun setting of from afar, forbidden love, in those minute minutes, does her heart also rip into two? <laughs> to describe heartbreak. Heartbreak is the feeling of losing your glasses when you're home alone. <laughs> After years of not understanding who could love a girl behind the frames, with anecdotes of sexy librarians revealing their beauty and superheroes only being super when their frames fly off their face, <laughs> what little girl is gonna feel beautiful in specs? I sure didn't. <laughs> Not until we get together. When I'm with him, I am safe. I can leave the performative, itchy world of contacts behind. I don't have to look a certain way. I don't have to be adventurous with my body and take risks to get people to stay. I don't have to carry my own grocery bags. <laughs> I don't have to be alone. Not now and not ever again. I can see. I can really see. And I see someone seeing me. And for the first time, I let them. I can leave the independent facade behind. And when I am told I can wear my glasses for the rest of our lives, I believe it. I love wearing my glasses. But one day when I place my frames in the same bedside table spot as always, secure in the knowledge that I'll find them there again, I return to find Nothing. I curse as I fumble my hands in the darkness that is actually daylight, but it may as well be dark because I can't fucking see. Panic sets in, the urge to call him for help rings in my head, and suddenly everything starts to change. I certainly didn't see this coming. How could I when the very thing I need to be able to see is gone? That I could lose my glasses. I knew it was a possibility, but I never really saw it coming. Suddenly everything starts to change, and my glasses are gone. He's gone. It's not until you're without it that you realize you took it for granted. That gift of sight. That, that 
feels like floating and singing and dog-earing a well-loved book and sleeping in the sun and softened eyes and the blind belief you'll never be on your own again and shots of whipped cream with sprinkles on top and embracing one another in the open air, grass staining your favorite dress and drinking champagne until you spin and the promise you'll never be alone on Christmas Day and skinny dipping in chilled moonlight. <laughs> Making memories that you'll tell, you'll tell your children in hushed tones one day, painting a magic scene because the solemn sisterhood of holding hands and running into the rushing waves, waves that are far too high in the world. <laughs> Impossible to find on my own. Suddenly, the world doesn't make any sense. And it's just me. Alone. Again. Forever. But that's not entirely true, is it? How could I forget about you? <laughs> A single beacon of moonlight pointing the way to my missing frames, <laughs> as if reminding me that I may be alone, and it may be for the first time in a while, but it certainly isn't going to be the last, so I better get used to it. Because even alone, the moon and I can find my missing frames. Even alone, I can feel beautiful. Even alone, I'm never really alone. Not with the moon as my witness. I'm sitting naked in a clawfoot tub. Across from me sits a well-groomed New Yorker who's using his bare ass cheek to stop the water from draining because we can't find the plug. Not really sure the point of a tub with no drain plug, but obviously the owner of this Airbnb is more of a shower person. The New Yorker's name is Harry. I'm giving him a detailed resume of my entire theater performance history, and he's teaching me for the first time what it feels like to have someone really listen to you. He's got the bone structure of every classic heartthrob and these fierce, magnetic eyes that make you wonder, are you trying to fuck me or do you just look like that? <laughs> we just had sex, obviously. <laughs> Why else would I be naked in a bathtub with a stranger from the internet talking about my high school production of A Midsummer Night's Dream? <laughs> when I step out of the train station on my way to our first meetup, at first I can't see him. There's a service truck blocking our sidelines. I go around behind the truck, a move he clearly isn't expecting as he jumps when I call out to him from behind. It's dark outside. At the exact moment of our meeting, the moon is 68% illuminated. It's true, I looked it up. Though the lack of that 1% I may never forgive. His first questions when we get back to his Airbnb come in a sequence. Do you want anything to drink? I think I might order food. What do you like? I think, do you want to watch a movie? I think they have Apple TV Plus. I knew then that this encounter was going to be different. August Osage County plays in the background as he tells me about his family through bites of microwave popcorn. Meryl Streep is in that movie. I love Meryl Streep. <laughs> but I can't keep my eyes off of his. I want to listen. I tell him a lot about myself, too. Not for myself, but for the feeling he gives me that nothing else in this world matters except for what I'm telling him right now. I sleep over that night. I wasn't planning to. I have school in the morning. 
The sound of his breathing lulls me to sleep like the careful hum of a box fan. My roommate doesn't know where I am. In the morning, he buys me coffee and sends me off on the blue line with a kiss. There are people around. We agree to meet up later that afternoon. He wants to see the bean. I tell him to meet me there and I'll take him to my favorite restaurant in the city. His plan was to leave tomorrow morning, or so I thought. Come to find out over a year later, he had a train ticket headed for Philadelphia due to leave while I was in class that morning after. I still don't know what compelled him not to get on that train, although my ego tells me I have a pretty good idea. I offered to let him stay over at my apartment that night. We have devil dogs for dinner, and I get a kick out of the way he says, Chicago dog. I have class on Zoom the next morning, and I send my best friend Audrey a video of me in class while the man sleeps in my bed. The two of us struggle to hide our laughter as the professor continues to teach. Harry cries in the Uber on our way to Union Station. We're holding hands and exchanging meaningful eye contact. I feel brave in that Uber. Normally, I would assume all Uber drivers homophobic until proven otherwise, but these final moments hold significance for me I won't let anyone else deny. He muses about how our encounter first began. I came to him from an unexpected direction. My being was surprising. He couldn't have predicted me, or the impact our time together would have on the both of us. In the final moments before the train departs, we exchange a kiss, like every gay romance movie with a tragic ending, which is most of them. I leave the train station confused. I don't truly know Harry, but I have a knowledge of him an intimate few share. It's strange the kind of understanding you have of the people you have this kind of relationship with. I don't know his favorite color, but I do know what his tongue feels like on mine. I don't know what superpower he chooses, if he can choose any, but I do know the way he can take up to 10 minutes to answer a question so that he might find just the right words to form his answer. I don't know his age, but I do know the constellations you can trace the shape of and the freckles on his cheek. I name those constellations after him. In those days, I am in love with him, and I am afraid to say it. It's been three years now. We've reconnected recently. We've been catching up. I'm actually happy I'd forgotten most of what he told me about himself, because now I'll have the joy of relearning his life and hearing him speak it. In preparation for him coming to Chicago again, I bought a second pillow for my bed. Yeah, I only have one pillow on my bed, shut up. <laughs> it hasn't been used yet. I'm starting to think it might never get used. I don't sleep on it, it's hard and unfamiliar. But I remain hopeful and ever vigilant, and I probably need another pillow anyways. In the end, after all of this time spent with a stranger from the internet who in three days gave me a better idea of what love should look like than my parents have in 22 years, all I can think about is, why have a clawfoot tub if you don't take baths? <laughs> making eggs and I cried a little because I couldn't cry a lot. I didn't have the time. So I ran some cold water on it and then I looked up and I saw that my reflection was laughing at me. <laughs> I don't 
Well, see what's so funny? That I was 52 minutes late to work, and when I came in, my boss said, We were getting worried about you there, bud. <laughs> As if I was supposed to laugh. <laughs> I don't see what's so funny. But I laughed anyway, like an imbecile. And I said I wouldn't miss it for the world. I lied. I would have missed it for the world. I would have missed it for an extra hour of sleep. Why wouldn't I miss it for the world? It's the world. If somebody says that they wouldn't miss work for the world, they got the priorities seriously out of whack. Like, are, are they holding you hostage? <laughs> Think twice if you're okay, am I right? <laughs> you remember that part in Batman Forever when Jim Carrey sticks that plunger looking thing to his head and he yells, Does anybody else feel like a fried egg? I think I'm understanding what he meant now. When I'm at work, I often feel burnt. Not just burnt out, but burnt. There are two different feelings. Being burnt is like being flavorless, like, like my boss's jokes, or, or going to sleep at 2 a.m. and then waking up at 6 a.m. for work, or realizing that those leftovers that you really wanted have gone bad, or dropping your favorite flavor of ice cream on the ground, or doing all three in one day. <laughs> Every day I get thrown into the pan and my boss cooks me up into a little crispy piece of bacon. But I don't feel tasty. <laughs> I feel more like that piece of bacon that gets dropped behind the oven and then forgotten about until you move out of the house 23 years later. And then it doesn't even look like bacon anymore. You don't even know what it is, but it doesn't resemble anything close to food. I wonder if there's anything good on TV. Welcome back to Corporate America Cooking Show! <laughs> Alright, so today we're making an extra special dish I like to call a depressed, underpaid human being. So the first ingredient that we're gonna do is some eyeballs. Yes, yes chef! Fresh out of tears to cry. You can always tell that they're right by the look of hopelessness. It's like the lights are on, but no one's home. It's also very crucial to remember that they should get no more than five hours of sleep a night. The less, the better. All right, so the stovetop that we're working with today is a Dell laptop with an i7 processor. Ooh. But you can replicate this recipe on any device that has enough blue light to scorch a person's soul. <laughs> So the burner is set to 15.80 an hour, cook for 8 hours a day, 5 days a week, throw in a bit of overtime for that charred smoky taste, add in a bit of uh, grueling customer service, throw in a dash of regret, and voila! Voila! Breakfast is served! <laughs> I need to go on my smoke break. No, you're not going anywhere, buddy. No, no one, one wants to kiss smoky lips. No one wants to kiss smoky lips. I saw that on an anti-smoking ad when I was nine years old. And if you'd have asked me what the most important things to do to be successful were when I was nine, I probably would have said, work hard and don't smoke. And I genuinely believed that if I followed these easy steps, all my problems would be solved. Okay. I prefer the moonlight to the blue light of my work computer. The reason I was late was because I was up late on Zoom with the moon. We've been going steady for about three years now. Uh, I, we started out as co-workers, and I know people say you're not supposed to do that, but we've all been there. You want to you know some fun facts about the moon? Well, she's not much of a morning person. Uh, um, she wears glasses. Um, sometimes she wears contacts, but they hurt her eyes, so she doesn't do that too much. Um, she's a big Beyonce fan, duh. Uh, she loves popping pimples. She's not a big fan of spicy food or dairy, except ice cream. Uh, loves to go to the museum for hours on end. And sometimes she's worried that people won't recognize the light that she gives. And like the rest of us, she has phases where she doesn't really feel full. But who can blame her, given the world that we live in? If we let it, this world will turn us into werewolves. 
who let fear and anger invade our hearts and make us swing our claws indiscriminately, tearing everything around us to shreds. And we'll eat ourselves as soon as our guiding light disappears. And, uh, or if we receive anything other than gold, silver is lethal, and second place in another's eyes is repulsive. And so is the sunrise, drying out our dreams and cursing away our courage. Now it's daytime and we can't, we can't shine as bright because a big obnoxious ball of realism is, it won't leave us alone. And so we're just hanging there helplessly, translucent, letting life slip through our sticky, sweaty fingers and letting our joy hide in plain sight. I love you turns into you shouldn't eat as much garlic. Or, I didn't really like that show that you showed me. Am I the moon? Are you? Whose light is whose? But I know that my light is real. I know it is. It has to be. Have you ever noticed that we're always either in the light or the shadow? There's not a third option, just varying degrees of light and shadow. It's just food for thought. I burned my finger making eggs. I cried a little because I couldn't cry a lot. tendencies until the lithium cut through. At my doctor's suggestion of adding a low dose of lithium, the idea of my diagnosis changed in my head. A carousel of manic depressed artists spun in my mind. From Van Gogh to Plath, <laughs> the future seemed pretty bleak. <laughs> my doctor asked me to look for any shaky side effects sneaking in. And sure enough, it had. In the morning, before any caffeine holding out my mug, my hands would shake across the table. I had tried to hide this secret for so long, steadying with both hands, hiding shaky tasks that took me twice as long. I could barely look my psychiatrist in the eye as I explained to her the hindrance 
study at the time. She had little options for me. Stable mood and shakiness, or back to the drawing board with safe options growing slimmer. self-destructive tendencies. I neglect to refill my pill organizer. It is Chicago summer. My Uber driver has convinced me that we have reached the end of the world. <laughs> I lay on the floor of my studio apartment in a pile of forgotten kitty litter pellets. The imprints press my cheek. I am the surface of the moon. I feel the tears start to well. I call Mira in Portland, but they sound so far away from up here. I can feel every one of the 2,119 miles between us. Tomorrow I will lay until I can lay no more, and then I will lay some more. I can convince myself of anything these days. Two pink lithium pills, worms in a paper cup. Water in styrofoam, mercury. Street light through slanted blinds, moonlight. My glasses pinch my cheek. No blanket over thin hospital gown, a necessity of purgatory. Stop the pills. Stop the work, a swoop of dramatics. I close my eyes and raise my hand to check my pulse. And the street light moonbeam shines through my eyelids, a swoop of dramatics. The When I was seven, I dreamed about a star. Not a star in the sky, one that was down here with me on the ground. Not a star with five points, a real star. But it didn't follow the laws of existence. It was a mysterious circular orb that was as beautiful as it was quiet. My seven-year-old star glowed for me. The darkness all around it only made it seem brighter, more beautiful. It dazzled and sparkled and twinkled in my eye. I wanted to be in that star. I wanted to be surrounded by its light. I didn't mind the darkness. I would have to travel far to get there. Better start walking, I thought. I look to my left and my right. My classmates from school are there with me. We look at the orb together. We smile at each other and we believe in its power. You know something is special when you look at that thing together, at the same time. When I was seven, I was connected to myself 
and to the universe. The light inside me was untamed, wild, free. It was boundless. I could have flown further and faster than one could ever dream, and I dreamed about it. My dreams could have had no limits, and I never got to use all that potential. When I was seven, I dreamed about a star. <laughs> I wanted one day to be a star catcher. When I was 17, my star blew out, violently so. I was doing laundry when it happened, and I spilled my clothing all over the floor. I fell and started hyperventilating against the side of the laundry machine until the shock passed. I felt an invisible connection rip as violently as possible as she crossed the border of Illinois in a plane charted for Boston. There is no science behind it. We had an invisible link still being held up on both ends and it was ripped in half. I feel a gaping hole in my chest as I gasp for air. When I was 18, I felt no pain. I played softball with a girl who was a softball star athlete all four years of high school. I held the bat. She threw the ball at me with an expert pitch, and I froze. I took the ball straight to the bridge of my nose. Ouch, right? <laughs> Wrong. I felt no pain, only pressure. The hole in my chest was like anesthesia swallowing the pain, swallowing all feelings, even the good ones, especially the good ones. <laughs> Not even pain could get me to feel anymore. My star, my moon, the center of my universe was gone. Only the darkness of the void left inside my head. I am alone in there. Anyone that's ever been there is gone. I no longer hold space for anyone. Yet at the same time, I have more space than I could ever traverse, and it's all trapped in darkness. The vast nothingness didn't even have the courtesy to be silent in response, only echoing me back to me. Fortunately for me, it actually lit me up inside. It was the kind of intimacy and love I had been waiting for forever and never felt like I had. It was a problem because it threatened to save me. It was blue, my favorite color. It was icy and cool to the touch and I went to sleep smiling for the first time in forever. I slept in the basement, and she slept in my bed. The next morning, she told me that it was just a little peck, and that it meant nothing. Nothing. Before the 
invisible rip could happen. I would do it myself. I could stop the pain before it happened. This time, I made my star explode. I hated the light. I wanted it gone. It hurts more to have the lights on because helping requires strength. I am not strong. I can't carry the weight of my own hope. I can't catch my stars as they're thrown at me. They hit me in the bridge of the nose and I feel nothing. I am lost in the darkness for the third time. Is anyone there? An endless ocean of space with no stars for me to catch. Today, I am 24, and I've been lighting candles, mapping out my mind, dusting as I go, hoping to be a star catcher once again. Every time I find one, I chase it, hoping that soon I'll catch one. I lay my left cheek on his chest as I wrap my arms around his torso. My cheekbone rests exactly where his stomach meets his breast. The warm smell of beer coats his t-shirt. I take a deep breath in. This is a scent I associate with my father. On Sunday mornings, he would let me have a cup of coffee with him, which for me meant one drop of coffee and a cup of warm milk and way too much sugar. I think my dad is the reason why I drink so much coffee now. It wasn't pants, it was britches. It wasn't dinner, it was supper. It wasn't you guys, it was y'all. I think that one stuck with me. I remember he would get up at 4 a.m. every morning during the week to head to his office job at 5. His one rule for work attire is that he would never wear a pink shirt. Men don't wear pink. Whenever we would go on car rides at night, I would point through the window and yell, Look, Daddy, the moon! It's following me! To which he would respond with, Yes, baby doll. My dad calls me baby doll. Called me baby doll. I don't know how many women it took before my mother had to put herself first. She knew about all the women, I think, at least the ones she could catch. I remember one day she found a clump of hair at the edge of her bed after picking me up from school. She left it there, untouched, as she cried in the other room. I later found out that this woman was nicknamed Red Hair by my mother. So. At age eight, I asked my mom when my dad only comes home on weekends. She tells me that his job is a two hour drive away and it's too long to make five days a week. I don't question it, I'm a kid. The weekends turn into extended weeks, turn into extended weeks, into extended weeks. I find out a whole year later via a Skype call with my dad that his new girlfriend had a baby. My little brother, Scotty. <laughs> Scotty turns 13 in December. A few months after that, he makes a surprise visit to me to Istanbul. He flew in all the way from Australia just to see me. With him, he brings a late birthday gift, a koala plushie. At 14, my dad buys me a plane ticket to visit him and his family in Australia. 
the night before I'm supposed to leave, we get into an argument. I don't remember what it was about. The next morning, I do not go to the airport. I miss my flight to Australia on purpose. I don't text my dad. I still regret that. At 16, I ask him why he won't buy me my first car. I mean, he bought both my older brothers their first cars and his wife's 25-year-old sons. He promised me that he would. Tears well down my eyes as I yell at the FaceTime screen on my computer while my mother listens from the other side of my bedroom wall. You know how this makes me feel, he asks. You are like a sweet, soft little bunny that I'm holding in my arms. I'm stroking your fur and I'm thinking to myself, this is the sweetest little bunny I've ever seen and I love her so much. But then, I don't give this bunny what she wants. I don't give this bunny what she wants and she becomes angry. She becomes so angry and aggressive that she bites me, she bites me so hard, she never talks to me again. What the fuck? <laughs> like he actually said that to me and still to this day I can't fully figure out why. Yeah, I um, never actually ended up getting my driver's license. So. I'm now 21. Earlier this year, I got a phone call from my dad. At this point, we had been no contact for over a year. He's dead to me. I watched the phone ring. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hello, Nasla. I really want to reach out to you and reestablish some form of relationship once again. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to start, but all I can say for sure is how I feel. And I feel very bad for how things have been. I really want to rebuild it with you. I only have the one chance to have one daughter and you don't have the chance for any other father. I don't expect you to answer, and if you choose not to, I understand. But if you do, please call me. That was the first time my dad had ever apologized to me in my life. He brought up the idea of me visiting him in Italy this summer, um, but the idea of me seeing my dad in person, spending time with him face to face is unsettling. For most of my life, I've known my father through a computer screen. I think I'm okay with that. This is the best relationship we've ever had. If you're satisfied with the message, press one. To listen to your message, press two. To erase and re-record, press 3. To continue recording where you left off, press 4. with Justin, our bellies full of Greek food still drying out from our day at the beach. I feel young, and it feels good to be young. I'm in the middle of a sentence when I feel a slight tug and pluck on my scalp, and Justin brings their hand around to show me what they've captured. It's a book, a spider, a little piece of lint, a twig. In their hand, they hold one of my gray hairs. I have one less gray hair, a badge of age stripped from my head, and I want to cry and maybe laugh because I want to cry. I feel older and I feel younger and I don't know which one I should want more. I swallow my pride and watch a part of myself tumble away in the breeze. If you asked me right now if I know myself, I have a feeling you wouldn't believe me if I answered yes. 
Sometimes when I look in the mirror, all I can see is my mother. And sometimes when I look in the mirror, all I can see are the fractures of venial sins that make up the lines of my face. And sometimes I look in the mirror and I don't recognize myself at all. And that scares me, that all I can see of myself is a muddy mixture of the slants and slopes of my mother's face, the wasted religious seal, and a suffocating awareness of time passing. And if I fight, flight, and freeze on the details of not knowing myself, they condense themselves into a little gray hair and a sea of brown. It's said that women are the origin of time. Their menstrual cycles and gestation periods synced with the cyclical phases of the moon. And that's how we came to know of the passage of time, of age. I remember watching my Aunt Fox die, my mom's roots, in her linoleum kitchen. I question why the concoction of dye in the plastic Tupperware is almost purple when the box clearly says amber brown. My head bobs along with the rhythmic brushings of purplish goo being spread across my mother's scalp. A lullaby passed down through generations, a lesson is being weaved into the threads of my mother's hair. The grandfather clock in the hallway aimlessly takes away the minutes for the goo to gobble up any trace of history that exists in the gray hairs on my mother's scalp. I see myself in the roundness of her face, in the crooks of her smile. I'm watching my future play out before me. My mother aunt and I breathe in the moment together, a moment of peace before chaos. My mother often talks of how similar we are, humorous and sensitive, constantly worried, but always saying we don't care what people think. <laughs> My mother and I raise each other, both in tune with the passage of something we can't quite grasp. We're both being suffocated by time. She tries to control it, and so do I. We try to know it all stubbornly, know it all so that time is a little less suffocating. We try to pluck out any sign of time. My mother fights her suffocation with rigorous dedication. She has one foot in now and the other in later ears train, always listening for the almost imperceptible ticking of the clock to stop. She tries to gain back time while planning for the end of it. Every few months, she gets her hair dyed, the roots of who she's becoming covered in a shimmering sheen of auburn brown. She pokes and prods at her skin in the mirror, pulling and tugging, trying to return it to what it once was. On the other hand, she started to send me dresses to wear to her wake and songs to sing at her funeral. My mother says she looks old. My mother says that she used to look like me. I don't know whether it's a compliment or a warning. I grow long and lean, same shape and build, round face and crooked smile. I decide to heed her omen every time a gray hair reveals its pubescent butt on my head, I pluck and my control over time is restored. For now, as she does, I do. My mother and I raise each other. We are the outcome and the scenario playing out a few steps apart. My mother's face looks back at me in the mirror and I hear the universal clock ticking, 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 plucking, plucking, plucking. looking at Jesus and he is looking at me as he hangs above the doorway of our sixth grade classroom. It's a muggy August day and the carpet is mildewed and I can see the sweat in the air and this wool plaid skirt is itching my thighs as this carpet is itching my knees as I kneel in the hallway of the yellow bricked elementary school. It is judgment day but I'm not worried. I am a good Catholic girl, a child of God, pure, chaste, mature. My long legs are cleanly shaven, my hair a river of golden brown. Any history has been stripped and plucked. I am God's for the shaping, I will pass God's test. <laughs> <laughs> a Coke can is placed next to my knee. A bead of sweat trickles down. God is crying. I am longer and leaner than I intended. My hemline is above the top of the Coke can. It's a pink detention slip and a walk of shame for me. <laughs> As I walk back in the door of the classroom, I glance up at Jesus, and for a second, I think I see him shake his head. He's disappointed in me. I am a growing child of God, impure, unchaste, naive. 
My mother and I raise each other, but never well enough. We cannot stop the time that is passing. My mother and God are ringing in my ears, and I start to lose my face in the mirror. I am 18. I'm sitting in the back room of a church, and the air conditioning is on way too high, and the priest's robes are too freshly starched. The collar is blinding, and my scalp is itching with the knowledge of knowing if I can tell God my secret, I will feel better. I'm afraid of getting old, and I feel like I have the weight of the moon on my shoulders. I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know who I am. I, I wish I were young again, sitting in the well-waxed pews, counting up sins to appease the oxymoron of a god in the heavens. It doesn't matter if they're true or not. I lied. I cheated on a test. I yelled at my mom. I kissed a boy. I'm afraid I'm going to die alone, that I won't find someone to love the faces in the mirror. I'm afraid I'm too much for people, but I don't know how to stop. No one told me how to stop. And I did my job, and I played my part, and I was the perfect daughter, and I was a good Catholic girl. I have a rock in my stomach, but no church will be built upon it. I'm crumbling. God, hear my prayer. I want to love myself like you love me, and I love my mother. I am 18. I am sitting in the back room of a church. The incense is burning my nose. If I can tell God my secret, I will feel better. I tell the priest I loathe myself. He laughs <laughs> and asks me if I know what self-loathing means. I think, of course, I do. Women were seen as divine, unearthly, their strength in their age and womanhood forever connected to the moon. Moon, are you there? I want to know myself like God knows me and I know my mother moon. Hear my prayer. I don't recognize myself in the mirror and I don't know where to start. What do I know? I know that to this day, choral music still makes me cry. I know that my mother is the first person I want to call when I'm feeling blue. I know that just as much as other people are the moon for me, I am the moon for other people. I know I can be the moon for myself, even if I know myself one day and I don't know myself the next. I know that I am and will be loved no matter what phase I come in. I try to tell myself that the gray hairs on my head are not a burden of a life unlived, of a messy self-image ravaged by time, of lost chances and feelings unsung. I try to tell my reflection, you have moonbeams in your hair, little slivers of space and time in a sea of darkness. I try to tell myself there is something divine about me. And when my mother and father and sister are gone, I will have them with me, threaded through my hair and etched into my skin. And that is a very comforting thought. Death is not the be-all, end-all. It never is. If you ask me right now if I know myself, I have a feeling you would believe my answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I've started to recognize my face in the mirror. This is a prayer for the girl swinging her legs in her mother's linoleum kitchen. I pray that she is unaware of the passing minutes the choices left to make. I pray that her moonbeams grow and continue to swallow up the brown. What a beautiful thing not to control. And when the clock inevitably chimes, all she knows is peace. for a big change. The four of us are handling it in our own separate, unique, special ways. One of us is keeping busy, one of us is idling, one of us is working on their sobriety, and one of us is packing. We went on a trip to the one who's packing's house all together. A train ride to Timbuktu and we arrived at our destination, not without drama and bickering. Nothing is allowed to be easy. 
We arrived on the 15th and stayed the weekend. We did our best to frolic and play, but it felt like one last good hurrah, and no one seemed to know it except for the one keeping busy. It was a grad party for a friend of ours. Sobriety even pretended to drink for the sake of our own enjoyment. We found out later that she kept her promise to herself. And of course, we're delusional, delirious, <laughs> laughing, peeing our pants during the game of beer pong. Or maybe it was just keeping busy and packing, because in hindsight, that makes sense. The one who's in idleness did circles around the gathering, stopping only to check in, say hi, or hop in on whatever laugh we had conjured out of our weeping souls. We drove back after the weekend, laughing and singing and bickering like a family does, getting closer to Chicago, the place we met, the place we swore home, the place that holds so much history for us. We fought about mental health and who of the people we knew we thought were in good standing and if it was even okay for us to decide that or merely speak on the matter. The trip ended on an unconscious question mark, and then one by one, dropping sobriety off at her house, keeping busy and idling next, and finally, packing was allowed to go home and sleep, or pack, or do whatever he does. Since returning to beloved Chicago, keeping busy started thinking about the future and big steps she wanted to take for herself. Idle guy started looking for a job, something to do that wasn't so Neutral. Sobriety hasn't spoken to Busy Girl since the trip ended, but Busy Girl has tried to text her about that new movie that just came out that they said that they were going to see together back when they were. But it was a one-sided conversation. Sobriety is a lonely journey. She needs her space. She needs her space. She needs her space. She needs her space, she needs her space, she needs her space, she needs her space, she said she needs her space. The one who's packing is preparing for a cross-country move to the place I know so well. His journey begins where I was born, sunny, unrelenting Los Angeles. And, well, we're all distancing ourselves from each other, trying to emotionally prepare for this loss of youth that came by packing's volition and involuntarily following suit because we have to. Conscious and unconscious, acknowledging and avoiding. It hurts, but it's what I'm supposed to do and what everyone else is doing, so I do it too to protect my heart from crumbling, to preserve the good memories, to keep buried the ones we don't like to talk about anymore, to prevent the inevitability of, I can't even say it, because we know that wouldn't make Mother Chicago very happy. But my impatience got the best of me, and I couldn't stand sobriety not answering my texts. You're supposed to be there for your friends when they're going through things. Just because packing is leaving and idle guy and sobriety aren't getting along doesn't mean that I can't be there for the longest female friendship I've had in my adult life. So I am going to show up at her door, let her know I am really here. I see what's happening and I won't let it. I checked her location. <laughs> She's home. <laughs> I'm not leaving until we talk about this. Why do things feel different? I rode the scooter 1.2 miles, park it in a place I cannot park it, whatever. I walked to the door. We can make this work. We've been friends for years. Too many? Well, too bad. Here I go again. <laughs> I take a step back from the door. I just checked her location. Her lights are off, though. Okay, um, uh, check again. <laughs> She's at Jewel. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Do I? Uh, I should leave. I should go home. She does not.
have to know that I was here. I can, I can take it all back. We can keep pretending for just a little while longer. I take it back. I'm going home. But there's a swing set across the street. And I am morally obligated to sit on this swing set. <laughs> I look up at the moon and I ask, should I stay or should I go? And we both know the answer. And, and I know it's upon me. A conversation to put the nail in the coffin to grow up a little sooner than I wanted to. I just wish I knew how much I bled compared to the rest. Am I bleeding too hard for this? Maybe a Band-Aid. A Band-Aid can stop a heart wound, right? Right. What if, what if this is too much? What if I just lay down and die? What if things will never be how they were? What if packing doesn't call or visit? What will become of idle guy and busy girl's relationship? What if we feel lonely? What if sobriety has known that packing is leaving as an excuse to not be friends anymore? I don't know how to play chess. Clearly. <laughs> Boy genius in my ears. Rubber mulch on my feet. Hands on chains holding me up. Barely. I see five things. A tipped over tricycle, the gate I walked through, a mural full of color, an empty swing next to me, and a big, full, bright rock in the sky. What if, what if one day, the moon never came back? Sean, are you still there? I'm still here. Me too. I'm still here, but I don't know where I'm going. I miss home. Me too. It's so odd. Space. Thousands of miles of it. And our voices vibrating at the center. I'd like to go on living. It looks like I'm going to hit the moon. Are you angry? No. Not anymore. I am. There's nothing you can do about it. We have happy days, sad ones, but at least we're here together. We're going away from each other. Perhaps. But so it goes. We won't be able to talk for very much longer. So long, everyone. So long. I'll see you all another time. When I hit the atmosphere, I wonder if anyone will see. short farewells. Their voices die like echoes of the words of God spoken and vibrating in the star deep. A group of friends in the city look up at the sky. One says, hey look, a falling star. The blazing white star fell down the sky of dusk in Illinois. Make a wish, they said. Make a wish.